So I would like to introduce Alison. Dr. Alison Pulio is here today with us. We're very excited to have her. Um, Alison is an ecologist and professional photographer who spends her time in both the Northern and Southern Hemisphere autumns, being able to have her two seasons per year of fungal forays. Um, Alison spent her time in teaching and research and in conservation, and she's led over 700 forays across over a dozen countries. And so we have the immense pleasure to welcome her to the stage today. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. And also to Kaylee and Bevan and all of those behind the scenes that are so important in making these conferences run so smoothly. And thank you all so much for coming along. It's my absolute pleasure to be here. I just worked out it's it's 20 years since I've been in Wellington and three years since I've been in Aotearoa, New Zealand, so it's, it's wonderful to be back here. But I have a confession to make right from the beginning, and that is I'm actually not a mycologist. I'm a limnologist, a freshwater scientist. But don't worry, I get in the right place. You know, it's not <laughs> the wrong talk. But about 25 years ago, I clambered out of the quagmire onto the heart, onto the land. And although I've been enamored with the fungi since childhood, from crawling around in the bush, noticing all these beautiful and bizarre forms, it was really at that point, about 25 years ago, that I think I became thoroughly fungally infected and I knew there was no way back. And <laughs> at that point, I had about 10 years of my nose jammed in a microscope looking at the deformities in midgefly mouth parts and, and beetle genitalia and whatnot. And I realised that my venture into fungi, I actually wanted to go back to the bush rather than, than be in the lab. So I guess where I'm coming from with fungi is perhaps a little different to, to where you're coming from. I know a lot of you working at a molecular level these days. Whereas I spend most of my time rolling around in the dirt trying to convince people why we should put fungi into the, the this, our concepts of what that thing out the window is. Call it nature, the environment, ecology, biodiversity. We all know that so often people think of the two Fs, the flora and the fauna, and the fungi aren't included. So I guess over this time I've seen myself as not doing the, the hardcore research that you're all doing, but being at that interface of trying to relay or translate your work across to more lay audiences to try and get fungi to their thinking. And, and often it's not just the general public. We know there's so many other scientists out there, so many biologists who don't realise that the fungi are so fundamentally important to how ecosystems function, but also working a lot with First Nations people, working a lot with councils or conservation groups, all kinds of people interest, trying to get them interested in fungi to understand what they do and how they function in ecosystems. So, I've been very fortunate, as Tracy mentioned, over the last 22 years to spend summer and autumn in the Southern Hemisphere, mostly in Australia, sometimes in New Zealand or South America. And then once it gets a bit cold here, I switch hemispheres and we go to the Northern Hemisphere, mostly Central Europe, but throughout Europe, Scandinavia, still in the UK, sometimes in North America as well. And that way, I get myself a double dose of fungi. And what's been incredible is not just to witness these different types of fungi and different ecosystem types, but also the different cultural responses to fungi. And this wasn't something I thought I was particularly interested in. I've never been so much into that single species, Homo sapiens, I've been more interested in everything else. But I realised the way that knowledge transpires, how people come to fungi, is not just through mycology. So I've been fascinated to work with all kinds of filmmakers and photographers. How, how do you capture and animate fungi? I mean, it's actually quite hard to do compared to, say, birds that, you know, do stuff. It's really obvious fungi, it's much harder to actually relay that. Or working with foragers, I'm not such a forager myself, but I realised that in Europe, I think most people I've met actually come to fungi, into the scientific interest in fungi, often through foraging. Or working now with all kinds of academics, with philosophers and anthropologists and all sorts of people who are using the concept of mycelium and mycorrhizal relationships as metaphors for, for their own work, for these non-hierarchical, non-centralised ways of thinking and running things. So it's been interesting for me to engage with different cultural groups to see how they actually become interested in fungi. So I thought I'd take you for a little bit of a quick whiz around, how do I operate this, just from the keyboard, around start, start uh, wide, wide angle view here, just to give you an impression of some of the types of environments and ecologies I've been working in. Is that broad enough or should we bring the lines yeah. down a little perhaps? Have we got a um keyboard? I'm just working here. If not, it's down, please. Okay, 
yeah, oh, yeah doing something. So a lot of the time when I'm in Europe, I've been working in Central Europe and predominantly in Switzerland, but also up in Germany and, and Scandinavia. And there we've predominantly got these beach dominated pagus of Attica forest, other broadleaf trees as well. And what's interesting, the VSL, the Swiss National Institute of Science, actually predicting that by 2050, 2080, beach will no longer be the dominant tree species in Europe. That climate change induced drying will actually see the end of these and they're likely to be replaced by oak. And, then, and this is fascinating to think that within the next few decades, we're going to see this fundamental shift in the ecology of these forests. But um, you can see how I've spent a lot of time working with members of the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. A lot of scientists there, but again, fungi aren't necessarily part of, of their knowledge. I'm sure many of you are aware of the global fungal red list, which was set up by Greg Mueller, Anders Dahlberg, and Mikhail Krikorev to try and get fungi onto these international red lists. But still, there's a lot of members at the IUC who, who don't have fungi in their thinking. And you can see here, taken from above, they're not just beech forests, but a mix of different types of broadleaf trees, oak, ash, birch. But also working up at higher altitudes. Switzerland being such a mountainous country, a third of the country is actually quite vertical land, landscape. So getting up above the tree line, we've got these very different ecosystem types. And they still practice what they call transhumans up there. So they're bringing their cattle and their goats and their sheep up to higher altitudes, up to three and a half thousand metres, often very high altitudes. So you've got these wonderful alpine meadows. And what the cows don't realise is these things up there called wax caps, endangered wax caps, <laughs> as they move through the meadows. And what's interesting for me in Australia, there's a lot of thinking around, you know, the damage that hard hoof mammals can cause our, our ecologies. But it's something you don't talk about too much there. This is very old tradition, cultural traditions of bringing the cows up. They decorate them all in flowers and march them up as a big parade. And at the end of summer, they bring them back down to the valleys again. But you can pretty much track the movement of the cattle through where the dock and the other weeds are up there in these alpine meadows and the pugging and the alpine calves. So it's been interesting for me to, to try and see what types of fungi are growing up there. Are there endangered? Are there specialist grassland species up there? They've got one national park in Switzerland. It's called the Swiss National Park. I don't know what they're going to call the second one. They'd make another one. <laughs> what's interesting there, we've got a different type of ecology, but a third of it is forested, but about 99.5% 90, coniferous, so mostly spruce and other types of needle trees up there. Also, again, these wonderful calms and alpine meadows, but about a third of it is actually scree. And you can see these amazing scree slopes, very, very mobile landscapes, constant movement through the landscape. And then we've got the glaciers. This particular one here is known as the Alech Glacier. I think when I first went there about 22 years ago, they were saying it was 27.5 kilometres long. So I was just checking when I was thinking about this talk that it was still that long. It's now 26 kilometres long. So we've lost 1.5 k's in, in the time I've been there. But it's also dropping in depth. So some parts used to be about two kilometres deep. And there's a hut up on the rock here called the Concordia Hut. And when they built that 100 years ago, you could pretty much, if you're walking down the glacier, you could scramble up onto the rock and actually get to this hut. I made that sound like a walk in the park, walking down the glacier. <laughs> it's, not that, it's not that easy. You've got these massive crevasses that yeah, drop down two kilometres. So you're walking down on ropes and guides with your crampons and whatever. But now this hut sits about 250 metres above the glacier. And each year they put another few runs on the ladder so you can climb up and it's quite phenomenal phenomenal to see climate change happening at such a visible and radical rate and there's an institute in the town called Davos some of you might know this from where the World Economic Forum is held and there's the International Institute employs over 800 scientists or 800 professionals many of the scientists which I find mind-blowing for such a tiny little country I mean Switzerland's about Biggest New Zealand, about 280,000, okay, I think. About a seventh of the size of New Zealand, look at these 800 scientists looking at climate change, looking at the recession of the glaciers, looking how all biodiversity in these lots of alpine environments are constantly scrambling higher, up to higher altitudes to try and find their ideal conditions. 
And they're looking at fungi as well, trying to actually find out, are the fungi keeping pace with the changing climate? And the terrible thing is they're not. So it's very interesting with dirt tapping there. And if you see this glaciers recede, and there's all this bare rock exposed, of course, the first colonizers are the fungi, the lichens. And you see these lichens claiming any bare territory, a lot of the invertebrates that blow in. And you'll see wonderful things like this, where to me, the extremophiles of lichen growing out of frozen waterfalls. So certainly the place to go if you want to study lichen. Then quite a lot I work over in Scandinavia, particularly in Sweden, with the Stockholm Mycological Society and the Swedish Mycological Society. I've spent some time with many of you know Anders Dahlberg, who's based up in, in Uppsala, who's been instrumental in fungal conservation in Europe. He's been driving fungal conservation there, along with the actress Ilit Sen in Switzerland. And so Anders has taken me to some of the sites that they've set aside, particularly for the conservation of, of fungi. This is some of the members of the Stockholm Mycological Society. And every year they have this thing called the Mykologi Beckett, where they go out and survey about 100 sites. So they have about 100 people attend. They collect this data, submit that to their Arten Bank, their species bank, and so they've got a wonderful capacity to actually map the species they've got. But what always strikes me when I go to places like Sweden, Switzerland's the same, or Norway, is you're pretty push to find a tree over 100 years old. I mean, I come back to Australia and I go, that's right. And I'm sure it's the same here in New Zealand. You've got these wonderful old nocophages. We've got a lot of old eucalypts. They're disappearing, but we've still got trees many, many hundreds of years old. Whereas forests there are so tightly managed on such fast rotations that you're really pushing it. I mean, you can see from the trees in the background to actually find any old trees at all. So it brings up so many interesting questions around conservation and do we have these older trees that support those older species you can see here this is up on the, the high north coast mostly oops kind of predominated not sure why that moved across and over to ice land again very interesting landscapes and ecologies there i always think the names iceland and greenland are around the wrong way <laughs> but um iceland apparently used to be about 40 percent covered in forests until the North Vikings arrived, which again, I think was about 800 years ago. Did we have an Icelandic historian in the room? I think it was about that long ago. But again, amazing lichenscapes. And I was talking to um, Gudrid Deer, the Icelandic mycologist, with a very long surname that's just escaped me. And she's saying there's some sites that she sampled. There's a particular interloma, pink fuel, that only grows on one hillside. And I think the the coral clavarians or lingera was only found once in Iceland. So there's a lot of IUCN red listed species. But in a country with only three native trees, you've got a couple of birches there, maybe alder, they still reported 3,000 species of fungi, which I find astonishing. About a thousand of those being lichens. So you can see here just how exposed and bare these landscapes are, and how, again, how mobile, a lot of scree. So in contrast, across to the Portuguese archipelago of Madeira, where you've got the oldest and last stand of laurel trees in the world, these amazing cloud forests. You've got Madeira coming from the ocean up to two and a half thousand metres, so you've always got clouds buffeting and these amazing damp landscapes, forests. You've got very, very little light in the forest floor. Trees are covered in mosses and other brassites and epiphytes. Lots of fungi, very little survey going on there, but very, very different ecology to where I've just been. And then to the amazing hyperspace of the Fungary McHugh. I'm sure many of you recognise these collections, which for me was really fascinating to find out that most of our Australian collections, of course, are housed there at Kew. So amazing experience to go along and open a box and see fungi that were collected over 100 years ago, and that dried specimen is still there. So incredible experience if you have not been to the, the Fungarium. Three years ago, I was invited by Steve Trudell, who's a mycologist at Washington State, to come across to the Pacific now, northwest of America and do a series of forays and talks there. And again, amazing to witness these very different ecosystems that still do have some old trees. Dominated by Doug Fir and Western Hemlock of the Cascade Ranges. You can get a sense of the size of some of these trees. And I was fortunate to attend what they call the 
key council meeting. And this is a group of very clever mycologists who put together the diagnostic keys, the dichotomous keys, to work out, unlock the identities of the fungi of the Cascade Ranges of this region. And also spent time with the Oregon Mycological Society and the Puget Sound Mycological Society. This is the, you recognize the Sequoia from the Sequoia National Park region. But most of my work is within the eucalyptus forest of Australia. I think we're up to what, 800 species or something of eucalyptus these days. We know mycorrhiza with a great range of different fungi, cortinas, rushulas, amanitas. And also not just within the forest, but I work quite a bit in the desert country as well. It's some of the best conservation I've found has actually been on private land. And what I've been, I think I might have been exaggerating the size of that mushroom in the future. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been working with a group up at called Snake Conservation Reserve on the edge of the little desert in Victoria, part of Australia. And it's been fascinating because I get to work a lot in national parks, but also in private conservation reserves. And what I've realized in recent years is that a lot of our national parks now, they're not properly funded. Rangers are doing a lot of people management. They don't have time for monitoring or looking at the environmental aspects or the biodiversity. But often these smaller reserves where you've got communities of people who are so dedicated to this land, sometimes they're living on it, private land that they're living on. They're actually doing what I think is some of the best practice conservation I've seen in terms of their knowledge of species, of how they change, of how they interact. So I've been thrilled to be working with this group, looking at the fungi of the desert, <coughs> desert country, and then across to Aotearoa, New Zealand, having spent a little bit of time down south in Fjordland with your wonderful Nopophagus trees and trying to understand those ecologies. But I was mentioned before about how when I first went to Switzerland and I realized that knowledge about fungi transpires in different ways. And when I first got there, I came across this really interesting species. And they're known as the pilt control, the mushroom pilots or the mushroom inspectors. This is a subspecies of homo or superspecies perhaps of homo sapiens. And these are the people who are highly trained to protect foragers from eating the wrong place. And so they've been going for a hundred years. You come in with your basket full of fungi, you pop it down, they pluck out the toxic ones and they send you home with the edible ones. <laughs> and within this tiny country, a seventh of the size of New Zealand, they've got 340 mushroom inspection offices around the country with multiple people in each office. So it's the most amazing service. There was a similar thing in France with pharmacists where they'd have their poster of the common toxic and edible species and you could go to the pharmacist and ask them to identify something. But in recent years, I was talking to a friend who's in that industry in France, and she said it's actually that training isn't happening anymore. So you might be lucky to find an older pharmacist who has that knowledge, but it seems it's not happening. So anyway, just to, to set the scene, you know, the little town I spend time in when I'm there is about midway between Zurich and Genève, and it's on the edge of the, the Euro range of mountains. And this town is called Bielbier, and it's settled in about 1220. And it's got the old town, the cobbles there, and the wall around the town, and it's got the, the theatre, and the church, and the courthouse, and the mushroom inspection office. Not in that order of importance, you know, which is the most important. And the, in the town, it's, the, the office has since moved, but back 22 years ago when I went there, this office opened at 7 a.m. in the morning. That's because all the foragers were already in the forest before that, before everybody else got up. And I'd get there at 6.59. I'd come hoiking around the corner on my bicycle, I'd have cobbles, with the most carefully curated collect, carefully curated collection of the deadliest fungi I could find. <laughs> and something be deadliest, it's a bit like pregnant at Christmas. So we had really toxic fungi in the basket in the back of my bike, and I'd come around the corner, and I'd come to the office, and there's a big rectangular window, and I'd look up, clock at seven o'clock, and I'd peer through the window, and there's through the window, there's a big long table and microscopes and field guides and big trays that you put your mushrooms in for inspection and all kinds of other important gadgetry. And behind the table there's these three very serious bearded octogenarians standing there like this. <laughs> very serious assistant. And I'd peer through the window and clock hit seven. And you know what they do? They're standing here and they'd see me and they'd go like this. <laughs> and I must have been thinking, no again. He was here yesterday with a basket full of toxic mushrooms. We took them all away. 
And she goes, that's six more over again. <laughs> what is it with these kangaroos, these old animals slow and they're learning? <laughs> But my point was, I wasn't really a forager. I'm a photographer or a fungi, and I'm interested in the science and the, and the aesthetics. And I wasn't really a forager. I thought, I'm going to forage. I first want to learn what all these toxic do. I want to learn the doppelganger or the lookalike. So I don't want to know what's toxic, but which ones will dismantle my kidneys? Which ones will destroy my liver? Which ones will cause an autoimmune response? Which ones will bring out some kind of dermatitis? Which ones will give me cardiac arrhythmias? Which ones will send me on a trip? I wanted to understand the different groups and which ones had different toxins. And Tom May and I recently, my colleague is Tom May in Australia, and I recently did a book called Wild Mushroom. And we based that on this 12 category system of toxins that was developed by the Australian scientist, toxicologist Julian Knight and his international team. This is sort of an accepted model now for different toxin classes. So, 22 years ago, I'd come along, ask them all these questions. They'd look at me. One spoke French. At that point, I was, you know, spoke Australian, you know, barely. And they, they, one spoke French, one spoke some bizarre dialect of Swiss German that sounded like he had lots of concrete in his mouth. And the third one, I don't know what he spoke. I think it was Romanish or something, something I couldn't understand. Or maybe he, he did that deliberately. So he didn't have to communicate. <laughs> but by the time they started to tolerate me and I stopped bringing them back, Toxic mushrooms. And what I do, I just come into the mushroom inspection office and watch what people brought in. I wanted to know why are they mixing them up? Why why can't they recognize a phenolic yellow staining agaricus from an edible agaricus? Or why are they mixing up different kinds? Do they not know about lamella attachment? Do they not know about the, the, the anatomy of a mushroom? Can't they find their way around to look for the features? Or can they not smell? Can they not detect that phenolic smell? Are they sense and odors of fungi? Do they not know how to smell a mushroom? You'll see people waving it around like a rose. And you can't always get the scent, those very subtle scents of mushrooms by holding it here. Or are they not aware of these mycorrhizal associations? Can they not differentiate a pine from a spruce or a birch from beech from an oak? Forests there are full of death caps. Good to know about oaks, although over there they make mycorrhizal associations with many other species as well. So I just watch what fungi people would actually bring in and why they were making these errors. And what I was really curious about each year, the Poisons Information Centre, Toxin Info in Switzerland, they produce a list of what people choose to poison themselves with. In Australia, we'll have all sorts of things and for fungi, it just says fungi. But over there, they actually separate out the species. Which fungus do you think caused 40% of the calls to Toxin Info this year? We had the most Amazing, I think the most amazing bump of fungus season I've ever seen this year. We had this long dry summer, 30 degrees every day, almost unheard of there. And I thought it's going to be a terrible autumn. But I think what happened come autumn, all the fungi panicked and went quick pop up mushrooms. It was the most incredible, not the diversity of course that we see here, but the abundance, the biomass of fungi. And so foragers were just everywhere collecting fungi. But what species caused 40% of calls, do you think? Have a guess. Tracy? Yeah, Chanterelle. <laughs> Chanterelle. Oh, you're close. So this is people ringing up because they think they've been poisoned. Yeah, Santa Dermis. 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 It's not as common there as it is here, but I would have thought that's the most common one in Australia, certainly, that causes cold. I thought it might have been, which is very common, or yellow stainers or something. It was this. The Lega an edible fungus. Why did it cause all these calls to the poisons and information center? And this is what was interesting when I was watching what people brought in, what species they bring in. Most foragers who are fairly experienced will, will concentrate on three, maybe four species. They're going to have Boletus edulis, they're going to have chanterelles, they might have a few other, you know, fairly, fairly commonly recognizable species. It's the people who come in with a basket like this with a hundred species and they come in basically and pass that responsibility over to the mushroom inspectors, but they've got no context for where they've collected. I can't remember, was this one under pine? Was this one under spruce or whatever? But what I noticed is when people bring in Boletus edulis, the condition of them is so poor that they'll pick out of the basket and then some will go through the site and some maggots and things will run down their arm. And I thought, this is bizarre. The condition of the mushrooms was astonishing. I thought if they go to the market to buy a peach, 
I'm sure they don't pick up that one as their thumb goes through that's covered in blood, but they can recognize a good peach. But what is it about collecting this mushroom that people collected in such poor condition? And I think it's so revered that, you know, someone's starting out foraging, they're going out, they want to collect a stone peel set, they're determined, they're going out foraging and they're going to bring home the bounty. But everybody else is out before 7 a.m. So by the time they got to the forest, they were all picked, and so they find this one in poor condition. And it lands in the basket. And it's often astonishing how poor it is. I often say to people, if you want to do that, go out. You can't see anything. Just collect some dirt and buy some at the supermarket on the way home. Free with the dirt on the <laughs> It looks like you've foraged for it. But I think this combination of what is probably extreme bacteria. I think probably these poisons are actually bacterial rather than fungal. It's not a toxic species, but the, because the condition is so poor, but simply quantity. It is amazing the quantity that people will collect and they're trying to digest all that chitin. I had someone come to a workshop once, a lovely guy, who came in with a basket full of sack and milk caps and he said, oh, I've got a big, a big basket full of sackies. Can you check them? Now, when you go to these mushroom inspectors, they don't just look in the basket. Every single mushroom comes out one at a time. And then they actually record the species and the quantity that's collected. So all this information actually goes into the database. And anyway, the workshop went well. He collected himself, you know, 56 saffron milk caps. After the workshop, it was about midnight, I get this email come through in the subject line, capital letters, four exclamation marks, bold that says, You have poisoned me. <laughs> <laughs> Like, yeah, someone comes to workshop and thinks, I don't really talk about it at the time. I'm interested in the college of it. I always get these questions. Anyway, of course, I see his phone number. I'm thinking, I'm not talking about emailing. Why is he emailing me at midnight when he thinks he's poisoned? Cut a long story short, I had this big conversation with this guy who's moaning and groaning in the phone. He said, Did you pick anything else on the way home? Did you drink alcohol? Did you take any drugs? And did you cook it with meat? You know, often meat is the culprit for these things rather than the mushrooms. You know, and then of course the final question. Oh, how many did you eat? Said, well, you saw the basket. The guy had 66 that from And I said, look, the good news is you're not going to die. The bad news is you've got a shocking case of blood. <laughs> and I think why the top four species, Chanterelle's the second, Cantharella sabarius is the second one on the list. The four species listed for course of poisons information. So the first four of the 20 that are probably there. Are all edible species, and I think a lot of that comes back to poor condition and, and quantity. So it's been yeah fascinating to see different ways people come to fungi, and I get really excited. Quite often, someone will come along saying, "I just wanted to learn one or two edible species," even though that wasn't the focus of the workshop. But now I realise fungi are so much more interesting. There's so much more to learn about them than simply what's edible. So that's really the exciting bit for me when people come across to the ecology, to the science, and to the conservation. Of those environments. So these are just some of the, the most common things that land in people's baskets. Very, very common species. I mentioned those three bearded octogenarians. That was 22 years ago. They've actually all since passed on. But a friend of mine, Barbara Holmstein Tula, she's the only mushroom inspector at the office now. And I spoke to her just a few weeks ago and she was sweating. She said there was a queue of people down the street with their baskets of mushrooms, and she was the only one there. And she said she had two newly arrived people in Switzerland who had a basket full of an edible agaricus. I don't know what it was, I mean, for compressors or augustus or something. And she said she's taking them out from the bottom to two dead cats. Like, how does that work? You've got a brown and a pink one and a, and a white one and a big boulder. And, but she said it's astonishing. It's like 50 mushrooms, but there's two dead cats in the basket. So, you wonder how that happens, but this, these mistakes are happening. So death caps, that's the big one they worry about. And in fact, if you have, there's a bit of a, an unspoken rule that if there's a death cap in your basket, even if it's full of lovely edible other fungi, they'll take the lot. And of course, then you end up with this argument where they're trying to take the basket with their mushrooms and they're trying to take it away because it's got a death cap in there. But other ones as well, like Amanita citrina, very commonly Amanita uh, pantherina, people confuse with rubescens. So there's actually more edible amanitas than toxic ones in Switzerland, probably in Europe, but Switzerland certainly, and people seek it. I mean, other rubescens, caesarea, other edible ones that if you actually, I remember once I collected rubescens and they took them away, 
And they said, we're not convinced that you can't pick it from Panzerina. So even ones that are very close look alike, so I'll take away as well. Even Ammonite and Muscaria. And then, of course, you've got all the Courtenayers with so many thousands of species, and we don't know which ones contain arelanine, the kidney-destroying toxin. And then you've got things like Courtenayers violaceus, where one book says it's edible and one book says it's toxic. So depending where you go, in Europe, different field guides, the Germans are quite, Germanic Europe, they're quite strict about what's toxic. You go to Italy a lot more or supposedly edible, or you go further <laughs> east, so it's not consistent. This little gem, Lithiota brinia incunata, very, very common, particularly this one's photographed underneath the seesaw in the local playground. <laughs> so they're very common, deadly toxic fungus, very common in playgrounds, trap edges, disturbed areas, and people confuse this one. With Macrolithiota procera, even though this is a much larger mushroom compared to the tiny Lepiotis. We don't have many Lepiotis in Australia. Do you have many here? We have Macrolithiota, but not many Lepiotis. But they also, they don't realise, I think, that in its small form, you've got that drumstick form at the immature stage of Macrolithiota. So that one commonly gets collected and also gets confused for Merasmus aureatis, which is another popular species growing again in those lawn disturbed areas. And of course, Agaricus anthidum is not that common compared to Australia, gets confused with edible mushrooms. And then you've got Galerina marginata, another deadly toxic fungus that gets confused with Pinromyces mutabilis. And you might know this one, it grows in these massive cespitose clusters of 50 or 60 or 100 different boring bodies, and again, Barbara was saying that someone will bring in a cluster of these, which has got to go through every single one individually to make sure there's no galerina in amongst them. So, and another one, very, very common species, Hypholoma fasciculari gets confused with Hypholoma capnoides, an edible one, or even with Flamulina and the species. And the other one, of course, Copronopsis atrimentaria gets confused with Coprinus tomatus. So big traditions of foraging in Switzerland or throughout Europe. All the markets will have wild picked as well as commercial mushrooms. Probably the most sought after ones, of course, Boletus edulis, other beliefs such as your birch beliefs, uh, birch beliefs. Birch belief. Cantharella sabarius, really popular, particularly up in Sweden. I think I think the Cantarella carries more currency than the Krona in Sweden. You never ever get between a Swede and a Chanterelle. That's a dangerous thing. Or even the Italians and their Chanterelles. Also, tuberformis is really common. Cantarella tuberformis and Craterus cornucopioides, the black Chanterelle. Hedgehogs, hidden rapandum, popular. Not so much Lepista nuda, but sometimes you see these as well, confused with, with purple courtenaires. Lactaris deliciosus, again, not so commonly foraged because there's not a lot of pine. They've got other bacteria such as Simonicolor and Deterimus. Occasionally you'll see things like Madiporus sulfureus, chicken of the woods, or some of the hericiums collected. So why am I talking about all these edible fungi when I'm not such a... <laughs> I'm not such a forager. I guess it's more so just talking about that idea of how people actually get interested in fungi, where they come from. And foraging is the main way in that I've seen in Europe that people actually become interested in their ecology. But more recently, I've been working with some of the First Nations people in Australia, and this is a group of Yorta Yorta First Nations Aboriginal elders or aunties up on the Dungala or in Mount Murray River. And they have initiated the first ever project in Australia amongst First Nations people to try and retrieve knowledge of the use of fungi. And there are similarities, I was talking about this a moment ago, with the Māori in New Zealand and Aboriginal Australians in terms of simply that knowledge being lost. And the only place I've actually found is really up in the far East Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory with the Yongu people, where you've got people who've been continuously on country there for thousands, tens of thousands of years, and have actually managed to retain their knowledge. I've been working with a woman up there who's using a cup of colinas actually to cure diarrhea in babies. So there is that knowledge still there of indigenous traditional use of fungi, but pretty much anywhere in temperate Australia or southern Australia where most Aboriginal people moved off their land, they were forbidden to speak their languages, they were forbidden to do their dances, that, that 
pass on that knowledge, most of that knowledge has been lost. So this group of wonderful women are working to try and, and bring somehow collect those skerricks of knowledge that were there. And Peter was very helpful to me when he came when I was doing my most recent book where I wanted to actually include some chapters on Indigenous use of knowledge and, and particularly Maori people and Aboriginal Australians. And Peter's very helpful in introducing me to the linguists who have been trying to ret retrieve that knowledge here. This is another group. This is Peter Moore, who is a Wiradjuri man, also along that Maori area, a bit further north into New South Wales, Orange Aboriginal Land Council. They've just got a claim of an enormous area of land back near Mandurama. And this is Peter with a white punk, Latiporus portentosis, um, one of the species that his people use for various different reasons. Similar thing to Māori, they're used as kindling, for lighting fire, for carrying fire, but also medicinally as well. So I've been working on country with these guys. Up around Canberra area is the largest box grassy woodland that there is in Australia. And they've actually put a fence around it to try and keep out ferals such as foxes, cats and dogs. And they've reintroduced betongs and other bouncing mammals. And this has been a wonderful opportunity to make those connections between the eucalyptus that the truffles and white horizon with and the betongs that feed them and the importance of this three kingdom association between plant, animal and fungus. So it's been amazing to work with them to bring these connections together. And a big part of when I go out with people is to try and start with a big display of collected fungi, just to challenge their, their idea, their concepts of, of what fungi are. What are not just the cap and stalk style mushroom, we've got all of these other amazing morphologies as well. And, and many people still don't realise that the fungi are the mic and the fungi, for example. And what's interesting, when I set up these displays 20 odd years ago, they'd be very, very scientific. However, taxonomically, I'd have them very, very scientific. And I realised that most people, I think, actually respond to aesthetics before science. And so I've tried to, I've been very interested in that intersection between mycology, ecology, conservation, and aesthetics and the tensions around that. And I've sort of changed the way I present things. But also I've been thinking a lot about charismatic aesthetic species, which I'll talk about in a moment. Also a bit of work recently over in Oslo in Norway, where they've got this, I was mentioning before, people coming to come from different areas, they've got a thing called the Soils Collaborative there, and they're actually bringing together different academics, mostly in anthropology, sociology, philosophy. In fact, I think I was the only scientist there to look at soils and try to get that architecture back into soils using fungi as the main way. So interesting to work with them with not a single scientist there, but they're really using fungi as a, as a metaphor. This is Jan Young Hutt, who's a German filmmaker, looking at making some documentaries on film. And you'll often see things like this on the trees in the forest, which if you have any German or Romanish or Italian, it says mushroom protection. It says you have that thing called Schoenzeit. So from first to the tenth of the month, you are not allowed to collect mushrooms. You have to leave it for the other animals and have to let the forest have a break. I mean, it's interesting. This is a country, Switzerland's a country of only, what is it now, 7 point, 7 point 6 million? But I think 7.5 million go foraging. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of people camping <laughs> in the forest. And there's also here, if, um, so you can't collect mushrooms the first 10 days of the month. But then there's all these other sorts of things, like you can't have groups of more than three people collecting mushrooms. They want it to be a commercial thing. And you can't go out between before 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. <laughs> so that, and you can only take two kilos. So interesting regulations. Another interesting initiative in Australia is the forestry South Australia over towards Mount Gambia, not far from the border of Victoria. They've got one of their pine, pine Australia other plantations there and they've turned it into they've got a new name that's called Ghost Mushroom Lane. <laughs> they've set up, it's got a lot of omphalotus city formers, the glowing ghost fungus in this forest, and they've turned it into a tourist attraction. And I think this is our first example of mycotourism in Australia. <laughs> they've had 70,000 people come to see the ghost fungi, a lot of school children. And although I think the sort of concept of ghost is perhaps more exciting than the fungi bit, it's still interesting that they've used this one species of fungi to get people to come there at night to walk down through the pine forest to see these fungi. So I thought that's, a, that's a, as I said, a first example of mycotourism that I've seen. 
coming back to that concept of where do aesthetics and ecology and mycology and conservation meet? And we know that concept of flagship species that we use are particularly usually a charismatic species that are represent representative of a group of organisms or an environment or an environmental issue. And they're usually charismatic mammals and birds and colorful, beautiful things. And with the fungi, we've had the wax caps in the UK with their grassland project there. But also in Australia, we've had our only reserve that was set aside for the conservation of fungi. And one, I think, of only about a dozen in the world. Does anyone know what that is? But a little reserve set aside to conserve fungi, a group of wax caps. The name is a bit of a clue. The, a new species that was discovered there is called Hybrisabi lane covensis. It's actually lane cove in slap bang in the middle of suburban Sydney. So there's this reserve there set aside for a, a, a community of wax caps. And we know that they are incredibly beautiful, charismatic fungi. They always attract our attention. Also things like the beautiful, colourful Mycenas, Mycena interrupter, Cruenta Mycena, the Cidio Cruenta. But what happens, what I'm really interested, what happens when beautiful fungi are species that we consider invasive? And this is a real challenge. This is, is this also an issue here in New Zealand, that Lashia Calicera? She's not Calicera anymore, that's changed, I think. Yeah, okay. But be beautiful species. I mean, little ping pong bat or orange ping pong bat, stunningly beautiful species. It's a saprotroph. You'll find it on all kinds of rocky wood. I think about 50 species of wood have been identified on here. And when I first saw this about 12 years ago in the Otways in Australia, a Wilson's promontory actually, I think now it's found at over a thousand locations in Australia, always in these rural environments, often car parks and track edges and picnic grounds and campgrounds, strongly pointing the finger at at Homo sapiens as the vector, perhaps. But I, one time I saw these two kids having a sword fight with their sticks, mm -hmm. and the sticks had Fabulasia colossa, and then they threw the stick to the dog, and the dog ran off and jumped in the car. <laughs> wow, it's, um, what do we do with this issue where something that's beautiful and charismatic is also potentially problematic and invasive when people don't want the control on that invasive species? And the other really obvious one is Ammonite muscaria. This is very I often get questions from workshops. How can I work a lot with horticulturalists and gardeners? I often get an email afterwards. How can I grow that pretty red and white mushroom in my garden? <laughs> so these tensions are interesting because you want to get people interested through their beauty and, and through their aesthetics. But there's also these issues as well. A very, very interesting point. So I guess the way I look at it is that, you know. Fungal conservation really only becomes effective when we start to consider fungi in all their diverse forms and manifestations. So I thought I'd just end up the talk to have a bit of time for questioning just with a few images of, of some of the more bizarre forms. I know you'll have a lot of slides with big graphs and scary things on them, so I thought I'd just do pictures <laughs> and keep the words out of the presentation. But this last slide I was intended to put, but my publisher probably they'd drop me if I didn't put it up. <laughs> sort of a shameless self promotion. But I'm sure this will be the least scientific technical talk of the day, but I hope at least it's slightly entertaining for you. So thank you very much. And I've welcomed any questions at all. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. I'm going to open the floor up, so I'm sure there's questions and um, there's more remarks. That was fascinating. Lovely Thanks, to see Tracy. some beautiful photography from places like Vietnam and Scandinavia. So thank you for that. But yeah, anyone like to? Um, 
It's not a very scientific question, but um, do you have any suggestions or tips and tricks on taking photos for mushrooms? Like what time of the day, or can we put that one you would suggest? Or My most important tip is to keep your mouth closed because once I was photographing tiny stuff, wow, I got my face down in the moss, and then I thought, what about a mouthful of blood? I had a leech that's gone in. Tiger <laughs> <laughs> the leech. I'm like, so that's the first tip. Keep it, even though they're amazing. <laughs> Look, I love working with ambient natural light. Personally, it's, it's just my own aesthetic. It's not right or wrong. So I'm working very long exposures on the tripod, stabilizing camera. And, and I used to, my way of thinking about photographing kind of is really, really changed. And or well, photographing, when I left freshwater science, I went across to photographing issues in rivers and freshwater systems. So I was working more qualitatively than quantitatively with, with river systems. But I've moved very much from those more technical diagnostic photos that you find in a field guide where you can see all the important features to something that I could call from informational to more, what I have a more informational images. So appealing to informational gives you data, information about a species. For me, inspirational images are ones that you can look at but not necessarily recognize the species. They're appealing to the heart. And then also with my other environmental photography, sort of taking another step to more metaphors of images, because unfortunately we've all seen these images of the inside of the albatross full of plastic and we've, they're not having any impact anymore. So I think we have to actually get cleverer again. But with fungi, they are so hard to photograph. They're often in the darkest, deepest corner of the forest. It's hard to get that depth of field. I mean, we've got all sorts of amazing features now with photo stacking and other ways to do it. But do you know what I also think is really important? We get really fixated on the camera and the settings and spend less time actually looking at the phone. It's like I've spent an hour trying to capture this, this species and I've been looking at it and trying to can't quite, it's not a perfect specimen, trying to get it right, not really happy. Then I stood up and what we find is this perfect set of perfect specimens. <laughs> spent an hour with this one. And I mean, also what's interesting, I was setting up a, some images for a, an exhibition once and I had about 18 images and I had to get rid of eight of those images. And a colleague of mine who's a, a press photographer, I got her to come in and have a look at them. And one of the pictures was of this Oroscarpium species, which only grows, probably the rarest fungus in Australia, on one peppermint tree in a place called Blackwood in Victoria. And I'd photographed it at you know, 6 p.m. It was already dark, it was too high, didn't have my tribe, but I'd been there on the tree trying to stabilize the camera. It wasn't a very good picture. But I knew at this point hardly anyone had photographed this fungus. So I had it in in my display. Anyway, my friend walks in who's a photographer, not a mycologist or a scientist, and I said, I need to get rid of eight pictures. She walks straight in, grabs the oroscope and throws it on the floor. I'm like, oh, I don't realize how rare that species is. She said, it might be rare, but it's a crap photo. <laughs> you know, I was asking her about the aesthetics. She says, write about it. It didn't take a very good photo, so you use words. And so I think a lot of it is about spending time finding that specimen, you know, Finding the perfect specimen, actually looking, watching the light. I think when I go photographing, probably 95% of the time is actually not, not through the camera. It's looking, okay, I can get some nice stability here, or the light's going to move there, or there should be better specimens nearby. So I think I would say spend that time actually not looking through the lens. But certainly, yeah, there's all the technicalities of, of well as, as well, whether you want to get everything in focus or whether you want to focus that, whether you want to get different attitudes with that side. But I guess stability and spending time just looking and the, the best way to find fungi, I think, is to sit on the ground. And that's where when you often see. Yeah, I've noticed that sometimes it's, I sit on the log and go having a lunch, go, oh, look at all that stuff. Like, exactly. You know, the angles yeah. that you don't think about a lot. Yeah, that's absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Any other questions? Bill? Yes. I think by educating people on your various different edibles that you're not, in a way, um, subverting modern culture by getting people to forest phase and look at the smallest features of the forest and the trees and see them differently. Is there any chance that you're doing that? If, if I understand it, but the question correctly and you put on the exploitation. I'm not teasing you. You know, I'm teasing you because it's yeah, awakening people. Look, this is a, this is a, a great question. When Tom and I did World Mushrooming, it was really, really challenging for us. So this book is the first book in Australia that actually differentiates different as a process. 
species. And we had a real issue with that because both of us come from background in ecology and conservation. So why are we running the that far again? Because it's essentially exploited here. And the way we looked at it, there's other groups in the pipeline in Australia on edible farm here. And we wanted to bring in, I guess, a philosophy or an ethic that starts with ecology and it overlays it with conservation. And then it puts foraging on top of that. So to try and say, until you understand the ecology and the conservation, why these is, is there evidence that foraging really hurts those collectible spots? Because in Switzerland, they've been doing it for hundreds of years. They opinion. have. And there's that big, big study from Simon Egli, they did a 27 year study where they basically harvested all the mushrooms in one site and they left them on the site and didn't harvest them. So 27 years, but so they do nice long term studies. And they found after 27 years, there was basically no difference the capacity of the mycelium to produce some mushrooms. But, and there's also a similar thing in the rural island of Alzheimer's in Oregon with chanterelles, similar study she did there. But what they said in Switzerland, the damage wasn't from the actual harvesting, it was from the transplant of the tree. It's yeah. simply the compaction of the soil, the damage. Which is maybe the fungal mycelium as well. It might be a reaction that they do as well, so they're over shopping. Yeah. But yeah. also, the problem with these studies is that it's so hard to generalize the results of that. Right. To, you know, this is one, this is beach forest or it was one one forest, one species to change the real study. I didn't want this to be into conversation. No. You know I, mean? I just wanted to celebrate my well, I think I, I really this it's oh, but it's happening everywhere. It's worry all the time because you know I do see evidence of you know, late and over harvesting. We had an issue in Australia, I was talking to some rangers up in Kuyura State Park where this is in the year 2000, a journalist in Melbourne wrote about the wonderful culinary value of neural and what happened was that there's a massive amount of neural collection in a state park. I mean Australia's actually illegal to pick any any biodiversity including fungi on public land. It's not like in Europe where you've got that. That's fair. I mean people should have a place where they can see Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. And apparently in the park so they actually it's the only park in Australia where it says Flora, fauna, and fungi are protected in this park. You know, it's usually flora and fauna or wildlife and plants or whatever. But I was talking to the rangers, and the ranger basically said to me, Look, we've got this massive area to protect. We're actually more worried about the ghetto poaching that's going on. Forget your, your, your morels. It's like, wow, you know, these are. And, and I've always been concerned about that that idea of, yeah, of exploiting by foraging and it's having an interest in ecology. But what's interesting in Sweden, in Sweden, the interest in fungi developed very differently. In Sweden, because foraging was very much an elitist thing. It was the, the wealthiest Stockholm, unlike the rest of Europe. But when you go in these mycological weeds, they'll have their compartmentalized box in one arm and a basket of chanterelles in the other. And I think they very much see the two as not being mutually exclusive. And so it's been, I mean, these are very highly managed forests, but it's these are questions that great, the great conversations that have, because I do have a lot of concerns about it. And I think somewhere there's a point where one can help the other, but you know, you go somewhere like some of the best conservation now is happening on military land. <laughs> yeah, right. it's, um, I remember standing with David Minter in uh, North, York, North Yorkshire Moors National Park. And <laughs> all the oaks were long gone, and you've got a bit of here, and a bit of you know, sheep grazing here, you've got a military range there. But conservation, you have to. To meet with any other land use. Yeah, thank you for the question. I'd love to continue the conversation. Tracy had a question, and I'll. Um, so it sort of uh, stems a little bit off from that discussion. Um, there's been a lot of popular science recently on, I guess, the communication between trees and also the uh, uh, more interest in the vitamin D mushrooms and just a general popular science. Do you think that's actually aiding conservation efforts of fungi or is it hindering it? Yeah. I don't know if there's any more answer. I mean, I think, yeah, I think you can. I think it increases awareness, but is it really exploited? I don't know. I mean, I think it's just getting funding for this awareness through whatever channel can be the starting point. Dominate conservation. Good question. I mean, certainly, for example, working with the land care movement for 30 years now in Australia, which is very much about planting trees, that's the, the main thing, putting trees in the ground. This land care started, I think, with Joe Kerr. Yeah, back during when she was Victoria Premier, and it's been incredible to see all those trees in the ground. But now what I'm seeing, people want to actually restore fungi, and they think, how do we plant fungi? Like, well, you, you can't really plant fungus, but if you can retain habitat diversity and, and 
minimize those stresses and chemical use, of fire, the disturbance, the killing, whatever, the compaction. I think that thinking is just putting tons into the equation, but everyday conservation for some, I guess. It's interesting. I mean, I'm quite amazed that the people who come along these days to workshop, it used to always be pretty much field naturalists and foragers. They were the few people who came 20 odd years ago. Now there's all these. I had a clothes designer from Melbourne who's doing fungal leather. I had someone else who's 3D printing with my studio. I had one woman who came along and she's looking at all the specimens on the table and I said, and what brings you along today? She says, I'm a crime writer. Which of these mushrooms will cure a philandry husband? <laughs> so I don't know that she's thinking conservation. You know, that's, I don't know that that's where she's going to go. But some will. I think some will. So. Curious. What's your experience, Tracy? Do you think? Oh, well, I'm a, I work in biosecurity, so it's a slightly different field. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah but, um, I think that there's a lot of uh, popular science is not always the correct science. And I think that unfortunately people get the wrong end of the stick. There's a danger in that. There is, and I think there's been a lot of concern about Peter Volleben's book. There was a big protest in Germany, and like 300 odd scientists signed a, a protest about that book, The Secret Love of Trees, yeah. because they're saying you're giving, creating a false impression of how forests function. And there was a similar thing with Suzanne Simard with the Finding the Mother Tree. Her, there's a lot, of, a lot of feedback about her anthropomorphizing and using metaphors of the mother tree. And so there's I think you're right. I think it can go either way. And I think it probably will go swing to one extreme and come back. And often these, that's often what happens. People think, I think the concern of the scientists is not that, that these associations aren't there, it's just that we sometimes jump ahead of ourselves before the science can actually support those beliefs. So I think that definitely is an issue. Yeah. Sorry, there's a question over there. Yes. Yeah. So going on this, so at the end, you were talking about Amanita and area and how invasive and how do we deal with invasives. So, from a con I work with pine foresters in Australia, and they're now coming to this idea of, oh, my God, the fungi are good again, because they want to reduce their inputs. So, from an ecological idea, or how do you balance that idea of putting some of these back into these forests, even though they, like their trees, are invasive? versus the damage that might be done from the chemicals that they would have to add to get these trees to grow anyway. Yeah, and again, there's no right or wrong answer. It's all about degrees, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's so heavily contextualized in this system. Or, and I think you're right, and what it's actually I think, doing is bring about a whole rethinking of these categories. What is invasive? What's endemic? What's native? What's introduced? What's naturalized? These terms are becoming really, really arbitrary. And it's very interesting when I first went to Switzerland. And it's working in German language. It's worth the weeds that exist. There's a colony of the craft that have been heard. And it's sort of like, wow, when you come from an island in Australia and New Zealand, you've got a very strong concept about biosecurity, what's invasive, what's meant to be employed. And when thinking around that is very, very different to that. You know, where, where does something move from being considered invasive to being naturalized? Or they're so blurred, the boundaries. So I think, I don't know that there's a is anyone answer, but I think it has to be contextualized within this system. What are the risks here? Are there particularly endangered ecology that could be threatened? But I, I think you're right. I mean, it's the, you have to wonder if it's going to be all those chemicals or other alternatives are going in. So I think we've got to, I guess, open our mind to a species can be right. And, and I was thinking about better out of the the I don't know what I'm talking about. It's got the combination of the storm around, and it grows all around the world, even in the certain countries with endangered species. And in one country, it's considered invasive, in other countries, it's considered endangered. And it's being, you know, on the AC and red leaves, it's sort of in some, it's, again, we can't say worldwide, it's got to be localized to this ecology and this context. And, and now it's, you know, it's turning up in, in potting mix in Italy. And, I mean, it's, yeah. I'm wondering whether someone else has better, better answered this question. I think there's a really important question. Yeah, I'm just wondering if in other countries they've actually you know, grappled with that a little bit. Because, you know, I sit there as we're adding in amanita into some of these inoculum, and I'm like, yeah, okay, I shouldn't be doing that. These spores are floating all around. So they're, gonna, they're just going to find the species that they're accustomed to anyway. Yeah. But it's going to take 
thousand years, ten thousand years, does it make a difference that you see data? I mean, that's the question. Yeah, yeah. These things are floating around perfectly. They're just looking for their. Yeah, but they're like goggles, like, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, oh, I don't know about perceptions. <laughs> they do have they do evidence of them on the outside, cultures on the outside of the shadows. Mm. They've mm. they cultured. online it will have like blast disease infection like it's not critically important organism it's all negative and, and i've noticed even in the bird mushrooming if you look in if you put that into something like we have things on the trove in australia and it used to have to be digitized if you put mushroom in there it's always associated with negative things the mafia is mushroom brothels and mushroom potholes and mushroom and everything else but this stuff in the existing in the brain language it just means sudden unexpected growth but it could be Someone's love is mushroom. And then we talk about, you know, someone's love will be kind of blossoming and blooming and you know, they're positive botanical terms. But there's often a lot of very negative 